it's my great pleasure today to introduce a very old friend. Um, looking at his CV, I actually realized that we graduated on the same year from medical school a few years ago. I won't say how many, Ali. Um, Ali Kachavarian recently stepped down after 30 years as chief of uh, gastroenterology at Rush in, in Chicago. And he continues actively in research as director of the Rush Center for Integrated Microbiome and Chronobiology Research. To detail Ali's many contributions to medicine and science would take the rest of the morning. So I'll just mention briefly, he's had a long-standing interest in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, laterally, he's also had a lot of interest in the microbiota and in the microbiota gut-brain axis, particularly in relation to Parkinson's disease, which has included some work with, with prebiotics. But he also has a totally other life in relation to sleep and how it influences GI function and vice versa. And I, I hope that maybe on another day we'll bring you back uh, to give us a talk about sleep because I've heard your sleep talk and it's fantastic. But today he's going to focus on prebiotics and neurodegenerative disease. Uh, his subtitle is Gut Microbiota uh, Brain Access in Parkinson's Disease. Ali, welcome. The stage is yours. Thanks, Simon. Um, and then good morning. I hope you can hear me well. Um, my hope is that in the next <clears throat> uh, 20 minutes, um, I will be able to convince you uh, that microbiota, or at least God-derived uh, molecules, uh, play a major role in uh, pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease, uh, either as a trigger uh, to uh, initiate the disease or as an um, enabler to um, incorporate the microbiota as a, a markers for progression of a disease. And if so, with microbiota-directed intervention, we can either prevent or delay the onset of disease or uh, uh, modify the disease progression of a very difficult disease to manage. Um, just want to... Uh, uh, declare my potential conflict. I have two uh, sort of company doesn't make a penny uh, that is focused on um, creating a designer prebiotics. The uh, thing we all uh, know about Parkinson's is the second most common neurodegenerative disease affecting one or two percent uh, of people age 65 and older. The cardinal uh, symptoms are known to everyone, uh, uh, bradykinesia, tremor. And unfortunately, when the patients have enough symptoms to come to the doctor and Parkinson is diagnosed, um, at least 60, 70% of dopamine, uh, dopaminergic neurons is gone. And the idea is if we can diagnose early on, or at least identify those at uh, high risk of developing Parkinson and intervene prior to uh, loss of so much neurons, we may have a much better uh, impact in disease trajectory than when the patient come to us already lost so much neurons. In order to achieve that, one needs to know why dopaminergic neuron is gone and now we have <clears throat> plenty of uh, data that appears Lewy body, which is a, a opposite nuclear aggregate, uh, a, a central role in loss of neurons. That uh, aggregated uh, opposite nuclein, which is a normal protein uh, produced for a normal uh, nerve, nerve uh, uh, crosstalk. Uh, is toxic to neurons, especially dopaminergic neuron. The question is, what is the factor that lead to aggregation of alpha-synuclein make it toxic to the neuron? And now there are, again, uh, several studies, primarily in vitro and in animals, shows that alpha will get misfolded in order to aggregate, and the primary cause for that misfolding of a synuclein is uh, inflammation and oxidative stress. And the question is, what is the, the source of that oxidative stress and inflammation 
and data suggest that resident uh, immune cell, macroglial, as well as infiltrating immune cells, monocyte and macrophages, are a source of that neuroinflammation oxidative stress. And of course, astrocyte appears to be important that would exacerbate the uh, neuroinflammation that is primarily triggered for macroglia. Now, the next question is, what is a, a trigger for macroglial activations? And for years, um, people thought it's all uh, in the brain, that uh, this functional brain is the source of activation of uh, macroglia. But the question was, why is it that neurons become dysfunctional? And in the last 10, maybe 15 years, uh, met, uh, several investigators, in fact, started by Barack, um, that maybe the source of inflammation in the outside brain. And Barack's hypothesis was not microbiota, it was a toxin or pathogen, primarily from the stomach and upper, upper GI tract to wake the snare uh, that uh, in a prion fashion would lead to uh, movement of um, aggregated alpha-synuclein to the brain causing uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. In about 10, 15 years ago, we modified that and asked the question that, why do we need toxin? Why do we need pathogen? Our intestinal microbiota could be a source for inflammation if it becomes disrupted, so-called dysbiotics. And we all, you all know that gut is the biggest uh, uh, site for um, microbiota. It's the most complex uh, microbiota. We have about 10 kilograms of the, uh, uh, the bacteria. Um, you already heard that it's uh, uh, probably 10 to 1 the bacterial cells to the human cells, maybe less, but still huge number and the gene is, uh, we have more bacterial gene than human genes. And we know that those bacteria can get impacted by uh, environmental factor and God being the largest surface area between us and environment, uh, then it makes sense that environmental factor that promote inflammation uh, could do that through changing the microbiota. For we uh, have, uh, plenty of data to support that notion that changes in mac microbiota, so-called dysbiosis, can be associated with pro-inflammatory state and even uh, uh, abnormal metabolism that you just heard that is associated with neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's disease. Parkinson disease um, uh, risk factor included metabolic syndrome, for example. Based on that, we modified Barak hypothesis that um, changes in microbiota, primarily through environmental factors, such as diet, stress, abnormal sleep, uh, that create a, a, a pro-inflammatory state that either through vagus nerve, at least in my opinion, is heavily through the systemic circulation, may, maybe through uh, extracellular vesicles, that reach uh, the brain, activate microglial, and uh, create the neuroinflammation, uh, misfolding of alpha synuclein, aggregate of uh, alpha synuclein, neurodegenerations, and vicious cycle, and go on. And also, neuroinflammation and changes in uh, the brain could come back in return, cause uh, more uh, dysbiosis. To test that hypothesis, we initially asked that whether there is any uh, aggregated opposite nuclein in a sigmoid colon of a patient with uh, Parkinson disease. We studied de novo early <coughs> Parkinson patients, newly diagnosed on no treatment, with a sigmoidoscopy, and sure enough, they all had uh, alpha synuclein aggregate and evidence of uh, oxidative stress, uh, positive nitrotyrosine, and very intriguing, they had evidence of um, LPS deep 
in the laminal proprio, suggesting that LPS leak or endotoxemia. And with that in mind, we um, interrogate microbiota not only in the stool, also in the sigmoid mucosa. Therefore, we looked at luminal microbiota as well as mucosal associated microbiota. And uh, it there was clearly abnormal. And just want to highlight, even in those that they were newly diagnosed on no medications. And the uh, uh, initial study, the comparison was random uh, control, but subsequently we uh, did additional studies using household control with similar diet. And again, there was abnormality. And since uh, we and a group in Finland published as uh, microbiota and um, quality in a patient with Parkinson in 2015. Now there are <clears throat> at least 25 different um, studies showing, in fact, exclusively in the stool, that they have abnormal microbiota. There is no a signature of Parkinson microbiota, but by and large, if you look at it, they have a pro-inflammatory characteristics. They have low relative abundance of Schwarzschild fatty acid producer and uh, increased relative abundance of so-called pathobionts, especially those in protobacter or LPS producing bacteria. Now the question is how that this abnormal microbiota uh, promote neuroinflammation. One possibility, especially considering that uh, one of the characteristics of dysbiosis is decreased Schwarzschild fatty acid is gut leakiness and disruption of the intestinal barrier that would release pro-inflammatory uh, uh, microbiota metabolites such as LPS that in turn can loosen up blood-brain barrier and lead to activation of the microglia. In fact, we showed that patients with Parkinson disease have got leakiness defined by increased 24-hour urinary sucralose. And that leak was predominantly in large intestine rather than a small intestine. And it appears that leak could be triggered by decreased Trojan fatty acid as they had disrupted uh, tight junctional pro uh, protein here. I'm showing the Claudine and uh, Zovan that was completely disrupted in patients with Parkinson's disease. Therefore, uh, as a whole, when we looked at our uh, patients with Parkinson, they had uh, the uh, lower abundance of um, Schwarzschild fatty acid producing bacteria. They have decreased Schwarzschild fatty acid in their stool, and they had evidence of uh, gut leak, increased sucralose, disrupted zoan and evidence of endotoxemia. Now, the question is how uh, that bacteria would lead to gut leakiness since uh, that requires uh, ligation of uh, uh, tolac uh, protein. Uh, we uh, ask the question whether there is any correlation between sucralose with message of uh, uh, TLR, TLR2 and TLR4 in our patient, and there was a robust correlation between that. The higher the leak, more of the TLR4 and TLR2 in the sigmoid mucosa of patients with uh, Parkinson disease. And to see whether there is any pathophysiological relevance to TL TLR4 in collaboration with Professor Krangles in uh, Utrecht, we studied the role of TLR4 in our animal models. That is a rotan uh, uh, neurotoxin that uh, disrupts the mitochondria. And in fact, uh, in 60s, there was an epidemic of uh, Parkinson in farmer using rotanone, which was a pesticide that's now since been uh, um, no longer uh, used because of that neurotoxicity. And uh, we ha have used that one giving the low dose oral rotanone that caused disruption of the motor function and a loss of uh, dopamine in the brain 
that effect of raw tunnel was significantly mitigated in tail of four knockout mice. They had less disruption of uh, the behavior, the, the motor function. They had less uh, uh, issue with uh, loss of uh, dopamine, suggesting that TLR4 appears to play some role in dopamine loss in at least animal model of Parkinson. The question was whether that abnormal microbiota seen in patient with Parkinson is cause and effect to look for cause and link in collaboration with Dr. Masmanian, we uh, did a, a stool transplant using a so mice. These are uh, opportunistically transgenic mice that they develop uh, Parkinson-like uh, pathology and behavior when they are about 14 to 20 weeks. But when they are uh, raised gen-free, in spite of that genetic abnormality, they have no phenotype. When we uh, did a stool transplant of stool from patient with Parkinson uh, to gen-free uh, ASO mice, they had uh, florid and early phenotype of Parkinson, both in um, uh, behavior as well as uh, loss of dopamine, suggesting that there is something in the stool of patient with Parkinson that promote Parkinson-like pathology in genetically susceptible hosts. And the question is, what is in that stool that is causing uh, that phenotype? And we uh, measured Georgian fatty acid in um, stool of uh, patients, and there was uh, significantly low, especially butyrate, suggesting that may be the cause and the reason for that is the study in vitro that we uh, uh, did that LPS can activate microglial in vitro. And when we add it with Georgian fatty acid, especially butyrate, the uh, effect would be mitigated. Uh, the LPS treated microglial, uh, treated with uh, uh, Georgian fatty acid, no longer could produce a high level of pro inflammatory cytokines. But that was in vitro. We asked the question whether there's something happening in vivo and in collaboration with my friend, Dr. Hameke, that he and I have been uh, putting together a series of prebiotics. We asked the question whether giving prebiotics um, in vitro um, fermentation, we can change the abnormal uh, shortian fatty acid in patient with Parkinson. And sure enough, we, a, a, a mixture of prebiotics that we use normalize shortian fatty acid in the stool of patient with Parkinson in vitro. To see whether that is relevant and can be seen in, uh, in uh, animal model, again, in collaboration with uh, Sarkis and uh, very talented PhD uh, student Rim in the same ASO model, we uh, uh, treated those ASO uh, uh, mice with our mixture of prebiotics, which I will explain shortly. And we increased the Georgian fatty acid and we uh, significantly mitigated the behavior, Parkinson-like behavior, as well as decreased alpha-synuclein aggregate. Or prebiotics significantly mitigated Parkinson-like pathology and behavior in genetically susceptible hosts. All that is animal. Is there any evidence for human? In collaboration with my uh, 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 friends, Dr. Hall and Dr. Gutz, who are the uh, Parkinson uh, uh, doctors, we, in the open label studies, we gave a prebiotic mixture. And I want to highlight that that was a mixture. There are three different prebiotics that each in in vitro showed that increased uh, growth of short uh, fatty acid producer. We wanted to have a mixture to uh, cover a larger portion of populations as uh, just only one prebiotics would not necessarily help everyone because the response to prebiotic is really depends on the background of the, uh, the, uh, of the microbiota. And 
very briefly, these are the 20 patients uh, with Parkinson's disease, giving the prebiotics mixture only for 10 days, 10 gram for three days and 20 gram for, for subsequent uh, 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 seven days had a major impact. It's we previously shown, and that is a different cohort, that patients with Parkinson have decreased short-chain fatty acid and short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria. They had uh, increased the uh, extravesicular, um, uh, extracellular vesicle and especially LPS containing vesicles. And when we give prebiotics, we manage to decrease uh, the re relative abundance of short chain fatty acid producers, as well as increased short chain fatty acid. And the data that I, uh, I'm not in the slide because I just got it yesterday, <laughs> that these patients have markedly decreased zonally. For in 10 days, they managed to decrease gut leakiness. <clears throat> How does it do it? <clears throat> A short chain fatty acid. It can do it directly to the brain because it's the HVAC inhibitor and anti-inflammatory. And of course, it can uh, has the effect by uh, decreasing gut leakiness in patients with Parkinson that we and others shown that uh, is present in patients with Parkinson. Therefore, if I want to summarize that in a Western type uh, diet, which is unfortunately low fiber, high fat, that can uh, create a abnormal disruption of the uh, microbiota community, leading with decreased short-chain fatty acid production and increased production of uh, uh, pathobion uh, activation of microglial neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration, and Parkinson and a vicious cycle. And that might be able to mitigate by giving uh, high fiber prebi uh, prebiotics. Obviously, I'm just a speaker uh, for a talented group of uh, people that I had the opportunity to collaborate, including Dr. Stefan Green, is the director of the Genomic and Microbiota Core at Rush, and all the microbiota is done by him. And uh, the group in our lab, uh, this is Dr. Shannon, that he and she and I started that idea of microbiota gut brain access in 2007 and uh, Dr. Cordova, um, and I thank you for uh, your attention. And obviously, I just want to acknowledge the source of my funding. Without it, we could not have done it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, intriguing uh, data there. I've got a, a number of questions. Um, the first one is from uh, Gregor Reed, um, who raises the important issue about um, the the fact that whenever people present data on changes in the microbiota in relation to disease states, um, whether it's Parkinson's or autism or depression or anxiety, etc., it does generate a lot of media activity and does raise a lot of expectations. And his question is, are we yet at a stage where we can say that a particular microbiota modulating intervention is indicated? And if so, is a particular prebiotic or probiotic indicated? And if so, when and how? Or have we reached that stage? My, obviously, I have a biased view. Uh, my feeling is that there are enough data, at least in Parkinson, it's over 25 uh, studies all over the world, that microbiota is different in uh, patient with Parkinson and control. In fact, it's interesting that a uh, paper, I have a hard time publishing it, when we compared it with household control, these are the people that they are the same, similar age of obviously a different gender, that they are taking, eating the, the uh, same diet, we did a questionnaire on, on sleep, unfortunately both of them are in trouble. They, their microbiota is different from random control. And therefore, some of the changes in microbiota we see in patients with Parkinson is a consequence of environment that is created by having Parkinson. But they have got a, 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 a different type of bacteria, which even from different from their spouse. Now, whether it is a cause and effect, I can't tell you for sure. It appears in mice, 
it is a trigger. But even if it is not the cause, the fact that it's present and it's capable of causing neuroinflammation, it can be a major factor in progression of a disease. But in my opinion, microbiota-directed intervention, which without having the diet, appropriate diet, is not going to work, is important to start in patients with Parkinson uh, because at least it can help them to uh, uh, slow down the progression. Now, the question I mean, is what they sh should be used, and I don't know because there is no signature. In my feeling is that using probiotics is useful if we have a definite missing bacteria. In Parkinson, no one has shown it. And therefore, our idea is to use in prebiotics. And at the moment, we are having the prebiotics that is promotes Russian fatty acid and decrease <clears throat> growth of TMAO uh, produce, TMA producing bacteria. I didn't show you, we have a, a, a data that is submitted that patient with Parkinson have a, a, a higher um, a number of bacteria that produce TMA and they've got a very high TMAO in their blood. And we are using mixture of prebiotics in order to cover a larger cohort of the patients. But that is bias and we've got some data to support my bias. Okay, so I've got a couple of other uh, questions here. Uh, one is from Glenn Gibson who's asking, is there consistent in vivo evidence that the carbohydrates used actually act as prebiotics? In vitro, yes. In vivo, no, I don't know. Uh, I, I, and the point is quite valid. But we have at least <clears throat> shown it in both uh, mice and in human, as I showed the data, mm. that when we give that uh, carbohydrates, we change the uh, composition of the bacteria in the stool. And, and I, data I didn't show you, change the composition of the mucosal associated bacteria, right. uh, as well as the short chain fatty acid uh, levels in the stool and in the blood, and the TMA, TMAO in the blood in patients with Parkinson. So, two quick questions to finish. First of all, is there epidemiological evidence that shows that Parkinson's is less common in populations that consume high-fiber diet? And secondly, is there evidence for probiotics or fiber to improve actual clinical parameters of Parkinson's disease? The first question is yes. There are uh, at least three epidemiological studies that I know of that showed patients with Parkinson are taking the, 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 the food they consume is low um, uh, fiber and high refined carbohydrate. But unfortunately, as you know, in epidemiological studies, the business is which one came first? Are they doing, uh, changing their uh, diet, yeah. especially in patients with Parkinson that got significant GI symptoms to uh, uh, modify their symptoms but the other thing is that Parkinson was less common in uh, societies that tend to have high fiber diet, Mediterranean and so on. Right. Uh, you, your uh, second question, not as far as I know, the studies that we did um, is, um, was short. There is one indirect evidence suggests that is the case. Then the studies in Parkinsonism, patients with uh, lots, uh, uh, poor cognition, when they looked at uh, mind score, that is a score that indicate the use of high fiber diet. Those that they have a high mind score had less progression of the symptoms of Parkinsonism. Indirect, but is, I think, intriguing. Okay. Look, well, I think we're right on time, Ali. In fact, I make we do perfectly on time. Look, thank you again for a, a very intriguing and stimulating presentation. And um, thanks to all those who sent in questions. With that, I'll hand over to the next session, which is going to be uh, one of the uh, student and fellow associated talks from Rita Ferreira. Um,